morena, kia ora, uh, kia koutou katoa, kua hui hui mai i rungi te kaupapa nei, uh, ko ai tēnei i mui i a koutou ko Takapai Flewoa hau, uh, he uri tēnei nō te whakatohia, nō te whanaapane, nō tūhoi, nō nā no puhi. This is a presentation that I was asked to do for you all and it's a privilege, it's definitely a privilege and I just want to do uh, a bit of a mihi, so I just want to thank Jane for allowing this pos allowing this to be possible. Traditional knowledge labels is a big thing here, it's a big kaupapa here in, in Whakatoa here and I just want to do a big mihi to you Jane and your in your ropu, your group, um, who were able to find a succession plan in regards to protecting the indigenous rights of of our tonga, protecting indigenous people's tonga, and without the mahi that you did, the research that you did alongside with your crew, it wouldn't have been possible today. So I just want to do a big mahi, and it was lovely to meet you a tinana nei, a kanohi nei, uh, to be able to sit there and listen to you and the passion and drive that you have for this kaupapa was just astounding and I loved it. I loved, I could see how much aroha you have for Indigenous people and their rights and e kore e mitu nga mihi ki a koe me tō, me tō rōpū e, e kahana ki te āwhina i a koe. Also, to you Maui, um, kare mutu nga mihi ki a koe mō tō whakapau kaha ki te mahi nga mahi mō te whakatohia o te rate iwi whānui. Nā reira, tēnei te mihi ana kia. Koutou katoa. Right, this is all brand new to me to be able to record and present this presentation in front of you all um, like this. But enjoy my wall, my back end. This is the traditional knowledge labels that was created and that we use for our tongas behind me here. And I love them. I do love them. And I do want to mihi to a good friend of mine who was also part of the traditional labels and her name is Courtney Papuni. She was pretty much the drive behind all of this before I had come along. And I do want to thank her as well. She was a very great motivator in regards to learning the IP, learning traditional labels, creating a lot of wānanga um, and making sure our people are aware of what those labels look like and how it benefits us. Now this wonderful man right here is Danny Paruru. He's our cultural advisor manager. He is from Whakatohia also, Te Apane. He is a great, great man. Like Maui, their minds are just amazing. And I could not thank him enough for the amount of work that he puts into in regards to the traditional labels in the local context hub, the research that he has done alongside Courtney Papuni at Rangimaria to make sure that we set we met the targets that we set out when, when this project was given to um, Ihikaro. So Danny Paruru, great man, great mind. And once you're in the presence of this man, I'm sure you'd enjoy his company um, alongside the knowledge that he has to offer to anybody that is willing to learn. So, Anaya Dini Paruru, Kuya Taku Boss, he's my boss, and all those lovely people in their photo that you can see is who uh, works under Dini. And the guys in the hoods, they are the Tiaki Taio crew, and they look after our environment. Tiaki meaning here, Taio meaning environment. So Tiaki Taio. So they do a lot around the trapping, um, possums, going up into the bush and having a look at our natives and making sure those are okay, collecting frogs, a lot of stuff, everything to do around environmental. And we use the biocultural, biocultural labels um, if we need to. At the moment, I haven't been able to use those, but Maui has, and I'm sure Maui will be able to elaborate a little bit more on the biocultural labels when we get to that part. And ta-da, this is me. Again, anone, takapo flavu ahai. And my role here is the traditional knowledge labels and the tiaki tayo. 
he uri a hau nō tūhoi, nō te whanau apuni whakotohia me ngā puhi. And there's just a little bit of a whakamārama around the traditional labels at the bottom there. The, those of you who don't know, but I'm pretty sure you all do know, they're just digital markers, digital markers for Indigenous communities to add local protocols for access and the use. Um, because everybody has reasons as to why we are marking them for their taonga. Um, for example, we may have a sacred area for fishing, and there might be only a certain time of the season where you can go there and fish. Uh, for example, we have an area called the Motu in Te Apunui. That area is very tapu, so you can only fish there maybe six months of the year. The other six months, it's closed off, so it can be replenished. But it's also closed off in remembrance of the drownings that had happened there. You also can't fish there on a Saturday. You also can't fish there when people die in, in the hapu, in that area. You also can't fish there on the day of the 12th, because that is a karakia day. That's a church day for our tangata whenua in Marauni and usually it's a church it's a church day for Whakatohia, for Tuhoi, for Marauni uh, around the Hahi Ringatu and that is when we actually can't fish at our motu and it's good it's good to have those put in place to be able to replenish our kai to look after our kai and just making sure that we give back that's how we give back to our kai to the sea So, who are we, Ko Waimatai? We are the iwi development team, and I suppose our purpose was to reinvigorate whakatohia cultural language and identity. And I guess it's to understand where our tonga sits and how it's cared for and how we access our tonga in regards to making sure that we can label them properly for our people to be able to use them. So we are based at Dihi Kaurua and we also work under the Whakatohia Māori Trust Board. Right, so this slide at Te is around the digital library space. So with the traditional knowledge process, we also wanted to, to create a digital library so it was easier access for our whānau here in Whakatohia to be able to gain our tonga through other institutions. So by having a link connected through our digital library space, we'll be able to be connected to Ngā Taonga um, and any other institutions that do have our Taongas. It'll be readily and easily accessed for our whānau through our digital library. And we received some funding just last year in regards to be able to create this space and working alongside University of Waikato, we are hoping to be able to launch that. Uh, around Matariki time this year, that is in July. So, yes, that's a good space to be a part of, and it's getting worked on now. It's a safe space for our whānau to, to be able to have access to the digital library um, for all our treasures from Whakatohia. Right, so what are traditional knowledge labels? Traditional knowledge labels are digital markers for Indigenous communities to add existing local protocols for access and use to digital, digital cultural heritage. TK labels are educational in that they help non-community users who view the materials understand its importance and significance to the communities from where it derives. So what do TK labels do? It puts data into context and it, it allows people to see um, what the material is about, uh, makes visible provenance and the ethics of collections. So I think the challenge for Māori is understanding the origins of the tonga that we are receiving and what they're all about and why it was created in the first place. Uh, the foregrounds relationships that makes the research possible. And that's where the origins actually comes into effect. Our people, we find that a challenge for our people because to understand the Tonga, half Māori people just don't realise why it was created in the first place and where it was created from and 
how did it all come about? Our history is sitting there and they don't actually realise that it's there for the taking. So TK Labels actually connects data to people, to environments and relation and to relationships over time. And we need this process because there is a lot of tonga out there that whakatohia don't even realise that are sitting out there um, in the institutions, in the archives. And it's up to us to be able to repatriate those the, repatriate those Tonga and bring them back so our people know that they're actually sitting there and we can label them to make sure um, that everybody is aware that our Tonga are there. Whakatohia, so YTK labels, it puts our voice as Whakatohia on all our Tonga information and knowledge. It reconnects our people to Whakatohia Tonga and Matauranga currently sitting outside of our rohe. It also allows us as whakatohia to adapt TK labels to our needs and share them safely with institutions. And going off that, uh, there's a wonderful woman named Shan who was a big driver in this kaupapa who connected us with the correct people in regards to repatriating our tonga for whakatohia. So a big mihi to her and also in regards to helping us, um, connecting us with the right people inside um, Aotearoa as well as outside of Aotearoa. So what have we learned? But before that, uh, there was a slide. I actually forgot to add that in. But traditional knowledge labels, what are they actually useful for? And I believe that there are many publications where whakatohia IP may be recognised, and that would be in, uh, research books, articles, research theses. So that's the first point that we wanted to make. Uh, museum and archives. Obviously, repository of our Tonga is important to us, and many of those items are held across many institutions like national libraries, online database, and platforms. So, there are many different settings that we have identified that Whakatohia Tonga, including within our own rohe. Uh, the creation of Waita, the Waita app that we have, uh, the implementation of historical sites, Google Earth, Google Maps, just many different spaces that TK Labels is useful for. But traditional knowledge labels, so what have we learned? Sign language. Now, sign language was created. Courtney and Rangi Māori were part of this space and they were trying to create some sort of system on how it was easy to teach uh, traditional labels a different way to other people, especially those who are hearing impaired. So sign language was one way of being able to teach traditional knowledge labels and what that looks like uh, for those who can't hear. And Malia, Malia was one of the lovely women who was able to help in that, in that part in creating a sign language for every single label that we have. Also, there was Wananga set out uh, for the iwi to be able to come in and learn with Courtney, who sh who did a week in Wānanga for everybody to come in, and she created games around IP, basic IP, and what that looked like, um, copyrights also, and again, the traditional labels and how we can apply and how important it is for us to be able to have the system for whakatoa here. Um, Number three, for knowing tanga, how important relationships are with institutions. Again, we need to thank Shan and everybody else behind the scenes who were able to connect us to the right people. Um, Nga Tonga, University of Waikato, the libraries, the museums, the archives, the, Te Papa, Te Papa, that was a big, big kaupapa that they spoke of as well just the relationships that we have to have with the institutions. 
also the scope, how big this kaupapa is in terms of reconnecting to our taonga that isn't currently under our kaitiakitanga. Again, this is where we go back to how important it is that um, we research and find the taonga that belongs to Fakato here and making sure that our people are aware that it's actually out there because there's a lot of taonga out there that they don't even realise that is actually, that they don't realise is there. So here are some of the examples of the TK labels. Uh, we do need to update this slide because there are 20 TK labels. Um, and we also have 10 biocultural labels, but these labels here, are just an example of what we do have in regards to um, the titles, what they indicate, what they mean. So attribution is just acknowledging whether labels have interived and then there's seasonal. So there might be a, a tonga that is specifically due to a particular season, for example, like the motu that I was talking about in regards to the fishing, you can only fish there for a certain period of time. And usually that season is around summer. Come the winter, that's when we close everything down. So that's just an example of what the label would be useful for. TK outreach, that's all around the teaching. So the youth, so there might be a tonga where... It's for educational purposes only. So we will be applying that a label to that particular tonga to say, okay, no, you can only use this if you're going to use it for educational purposes in regards to schools, colleges, universities, so to speak, not just for pure pleasure. Yes, so those are just some examples of some labels that we do have. And now we get to the great, awesome, amazing part of making sure that that tonga becomes ours. Mother. So the, the labels application process, we receive the item. So it's added to the master metadata sheet. Then it goes to the digital library. And then the access to the metadata. So we read the description, provide feedback, if any, to the whanau or institution. So if we get that taonga and we're not quite sure about it, we'll go back to the original source and just say, hey, where does this come from? Why, why was it created? Or who do we talk to to make sure that the information that we have received is correct? Then we add any other comments or information that is required for that taonga. In the local context hub, we are creating a new project. Um, and then from there, we apply the label, editor, admin, make any necessary edits during to the appro approval process. We await approval from the admin. So the admin is a selective of people, a selected. There are people on there who are able to approve or give approval in regards to the taonga that has been, the project that has been created in the local context hub. Then I come along and I apply that label, and th but that's after having a bit of a Cordial, bit of a chat with my crew here. So we all get together, maybe on a Monday, we will get together on a Monday. And if I have received any sort of tonga, we all have a bit of a talk about it, what that looks like, what the labels may look like, and what the creator or the original source of that tonga has requested in regards to what type of label should be on there. Uh, we get our notifications, notifications to institutions. So we send it out to the institutions to say, hey, this has been applied. Uh, the institutions get that information. And then the fourth process is a monthly report, report to the advisory committee, overview of projects, labels applied, terms and reference. So this is just a bit of a, a bit of a tiro tiro of what our metadata master copy looks like. So it has the institution ID, the reference ID, the document of what it is. It has the title of the document, the taonga, the treasure, the description of what that taonga is all about um, and what kind of source it is. So it could be a book, it could be a, a audio, a video, an image, depending on what that is. It also has the link as well, the link that's um, titled to that taonga and where it comes from. And this 
it's just some screenshots that I had taken just to give you all a look at what I, I see in the local context hub. So this is um, a project that's already been created. So as you can see on the right hand side here is the labels that have been applied. I believe this is the Whakatohia Treaty Settlement and it's around hapu, it's around outreach which means educational purposes. The tick here means it's been verified. So the original source has said yes, that is correct information. So when you see a tick, it just means that it has been verified and that's always a good thing to have. So if you've got a tick, great work. Research is all done. So applying labels and creating new projects. So this is what it looks like when you're in the local context hub to create a new project and applying the labels and the labels that has been attached to the Whakatohia Treaty Settlement, uh, these labels on the right hand side here. And one of those labels is TK Culturally Sensitive. So that label is being used to indicate that this material has cultural or historical sensitive sensitivities. Uh, the label asks is for care to be taken when this material is accessed, used and circulated, especially when materials are first returned or reunited with communities of origin. So in some instances, instances the, this label will indicate that there are specific permissions um, for use of this material required directly from the community itself. So that's what that label is uh, particular to in regards to cultural sensitivity. The next one, like I said, the tick is purely just saying for mana here. So it's been verified by their origin source around the Whakatohia Treaty Settlement. So it just considered that the label affirms that the representation and presentation of this material is in keeping with community expectations and cultural protocols. Uh, it lets you know that for the individual family or community represented in this material, use is considered fair, reasonable and respectful. And the next one is the outreach. I love the outreach one. That's Toro. I love the outreach one. And that is because it's always for educational purposes. And I believe that all tonga that we receive um, should be used for educational purposes for our tamariki because they are the ones that's going to be carrying on with everything that we are doing today and making sure that our real our tonga are safe, our reo is safe, our Māori tanga is safe, um, our indigenous rights are protected. And if we get it right the first time, our tamariki will only have to be there to just tiaki, to look after it. And ta-da! This is just a, a little snippet of the, the Whakatohia Digital Library. And that's it's exciting. It's exciting for Whakatohia. It's exciting for those who are creating this for our people in Whakatohia. And as you can see, uh, there's just a little bit of a, what would you call that? There's a snippet of what's in there. So Volkner, that would have come from the local context hub, it would have come from our metadata, the main metadata sheet. And at the bottom of that, you would see the labels that have been attached to that item. And here is another example of different labels that have been attached to this particular tonga in regards to Wiramu Kingi, to Reverend Volkner. Volkner is a very, very famous person, and I'm sure Ma we will be able to elaborate a little bit more around what Volk who Volkner is and how he is famous in Whakatau here. Um, however, there's just a little bit of a whakamarama, a bit of a... Um, information on what traditional knowledge label for family is. This label is being used to indicate that this material is traditionally and usually not publicly available. The label is correcting and misunderstanding about circulation options for this material and letting any users know that this material has specific conditions for sharing between family members. So that's that label in the middle there with the dots. Look, that circle one, that's called TK family. So 
that, that's a bit of a whakamarama description on what that label looks like. And I, sorry, and I just wanted to share with you all our Whakatohia Waiata digital app that we have, and it, it is amazing. So every single Waiata that has been created here in Whakatohia or um, written by great, great Pakekes in Whakatohia is based on this Waiata app that was created before I started here in and. and it has been done through Fire Nida, uh, Courtney, Rangimari, Danny, and I just want to thank them for this resource. And, and I'm sure that Iwi would be proud to have this resource as well um, to make sure, because it has the description of what the waiata is about, it has the words, the correct kupu for each waiata. You could even listen to it to make sure you've got the right, um, we call it rangi or taki, uh, the right beat and tune. For, for the waiata. Uh, each waiata is different on here and it's beautiful to see. Also, you can see that they all have been labelled and how you can use those waiata. So you can't just go out there and sing them anywhere. Um, the label will advise you on what you can use the waiata for. Um, and the nuinga or na waiata, you can use it for educational purposes. But some waiata you can't just pick up and just go and sing it anywhere like you wouldn't sing uh, a particular motiatea, which is in our Whakatohia Waiatea app at a different town, like New York, <laughs> um, depending on the five quarter, I suppose. But that's something else. Maui can elaborate. Hey, Maui, you're welcome. Um, otherwise, these institutions here, uh, the University of Waikato, Digitech is where I work. Whakatohia Māori Trust Board is who we are based under. Uh, and our digital library, Whakatohia, Whakairinga Taonga Digital Library. I just want to do a big mihi to everybody who is sitting there in New York. I wish I was there, but I'm not. Um, but enjoy Maui. Uh, thank you. And it's been a pleasure to be able to do this. This was so hard for me. But... I do do um, thank yous all, Jane, Maui, Jane and her crew, Maui and us, and Shan. Shan is another big person who has helped us get through and making sure this project is useful in Whakatohia and how useful it is and it's going to be carrying on for years to come. So thank you very much. Atu i tēnā, e mihi ana ki a koutou katoa, ko hui hui mai i tēnā i rangi. Ka kite. Hi everyone, I'm Joshua Shaw, a developer at Dartmouth College located in Hanover, New Hampshire. I'm a member of the library's technology team, and I work with a variety of applications with a focus on digital scholarly software. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that Dartmouth is located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Abenaki Nation, and that much of the capital used to found Dartmouth was obtained with the help of Samson Ockham, a Mohegan minister whose contributions have never been fully acknowledged. Today I'd like to share my experience working with Local Context to develop an integration between the Local Context Hub and Archive Space, an open source application used to manage archival and manuscript collections. Before I talk about some of the details of the integration, I'd like to describe why we started down this path. Dartmouth Library and the Hood Museum are the recipients of a Mellon Grant, advancing pathways for long-term collaboration. The grant aims to advance significant cross-institutional and community-centered collaboration grounded in Dartmouth's Native American and Indigenous Arctic collections. Integrating the local context labels and notices and partnering with communities to identify and return control of materials was identified as a key part of the collaboration the grant aims to foster and encourage. Like many institutions, Dartmouth's collections are quite broad and we hold a variety of material related to indigenous communities. These include a significant collection related to the Abenaki, as well as a large set of polar collections, some of which contain troubling material related to the indigenous peoples of both the Arctic and Antarctic regions. We have sound recordings, imagery, and other ethnographic data that should be reviewed by the communities represented in the material so that we can identify material where control should be returned to that community. 
I also want to talk a bit about my journey as I developed this integration. When I first started working on the integration, the hub was still being developed, and I somewhat naively assumed that the workflows and applications like Mukatu were the best examples of how to use labels and notices. Because that seemed straightforward, I created an initial proof of concept, and then demonstrated that to the local context team. That first meeting was my first real introduction to the complexities involved in managing indigenous rights, and made me realize that many of my earlier assumptions were too simplistic, and that I needed to learn a lot more about how these processes were intended to work before creating a true integration. It also became apparent that the hub was going to be key to any future work, and that I needed to understand that pretty thoroughly before doing any further development. Of course, that first meeting led to many others as our collaboration grew, and resulted in the integration that I'll be discussing today. Before I move on to specifics, I want to mention a couple of people that were key to that collaboration. Ashley and Deanna, who saw my messages all too frequently in their inboxes. I also want to thank Corey Rowe and the rest of the Local Context team for extending the invitation to participate in the summit. ArchivesSpace is an open source tool that we use to manage and describe archival and manuscript collections. It provides a staff interface for data entry and management, and a public interface, the PUI, for discovery. It uses DAX for its descriptive metadata, but also provides mappings to other metadata schemas like EAD and MARC. It can be integrated with other applications. We've integrated it with Preservica, a digital preservation application, and OnBase, a records management system, among others. To give everyone a bit more familiarity with the way we work with archival or manuscript collections, here are a couple of views of a typical collection. The top left image shows you a hierarchical tree view of the collection, while the other images show some additional details about the collection. The first level in the collection is referred to as a resource, while the additional sublevels are archival objects which can be labeled to indicate how they fit into the collection hierarchy. This illustrates one of the key differences between describing archival and manuscript collections and single object description like you typically find in a standard catalog or museum. The context of an object in an archival or manuscript collection is critical. Here's a real world example. We have a file called Pound, Ezra, 1912 to 1962. That might be interesting by itself, but when you see the full hierarchy, you learn that this is in the Robert Frost papers, and that it's subject files, and that it contains an undated draft of a letter in pencil, presumably to Kathleen Morrison, regarding Ezra Pound and Frost's involvement in Pound's incarceration in a mental hospital. It's even more interesting. The public interface, or PUI, presents a similar view to the public, and I'm showing you our very customized version of that here. Again, you have that hierarchical tree view that is so crucial for understanding the context of the object you are currently viewing. The PUI also provides information on citation elements, how to set up a request to view the object, and how to request copies. Those are the images on the right. ArchivesSpace can be customized by adding or overriding functionality with plugins, which interact with or override the core application to provide that extra or changed functionality. When I create a new plugin, I always create it with community sharing in mind. I try to take our local needs and generalize those to suit a wider audience. If a plugin has widespread adoption, it can also be incorporated into the core code. This helps provide that extra functionality to smaller institutions or institutions that use a hosted version of ArchivesSpace. I've included some examples of plugins that we use and broken them out into the different types of functionality. The Local Context plugin provides staff users with the ability to link an object in ArchivesSpace with a Local Context Hub project using the API provided by Local Contexts. The hub project ID is the unique identifier that we use to link the two applications. Resources, accessions, archival objects, digital objects, and digital object components can all be linked to a project. Once linked, the local context labels, notices, and other data associated with the project will be displayed in archive space, both in the staff interface and the PUI. I'll note that all of the data you see in this presentation comes from the development API. There are a lot of placeholders and lorem ipsum used to demonstrate functionality. All ArchivesSpace users can view existing local context projects, but need elevated permissions to manage them. This is a view of what a user might see in ArchivesSpace, with the standard options that ArchivesSpace provides for any list or search view. From the overall list of local context projects, you can view the details for a specific project. In addition to the standard basic details and linked records list, you can also choose to view the local context data. Labels and notices data is formatted for a nicer display, but the entirety of the API data is also viewable in raw JSON. 
The local context data view is toggled by the See Local Context Data button. The Link Records portion of this view shows which objects in Archive Space have been linked to this project. Here are some examples of what the staff view looks like when you look at the local context data. On the left side are the basic project details and the labels and notices for this project. On the right is the raw JSON data. A label can include translations into one or more languages. If translations are available, then there's an additional toggle to view those translations. Translations are displayed with the title and the language the translation is in. If there's an audio file associated with a label or notice, that audio file is also rendered inline in the native browser audio tag. Local context data presented in archive space is fetched from the hub on an ongoing basis and cached locally to prevent overloading the API. The caching times are configurable, but you'll want to work with the local context team if you change those from the default values, since we've worked to define times that we anticipate will work for the majority of use cases. Each time a local context project's data is viewed in archive space, the plugin checks the locally cached copy to see if it's out of date. If it is, the plugin fetches an updated version of the data from the Hub API. If the data is still fresh, then the plugin displays the data from the cached copy. In addition to the automatic cache refresh, you can choose to refresh the cache for a specific project or all projects manually. Those options are accessible from the same page as the list of all projects. It's unlikely that you'll need to refresh all projects manually, since the plugin automatically refreshes all project data on an ongoing basis. How do we go about linking a local context project to a record? ArchivesSpace provides a standard mechanism for adding additional data to a record, and the plugin follows that standard workflow. You can add a local context project subrecord to resources, accessions, archival objects, digital objects, and digital object components, and then use the standard type ahead to find and link to a specific project. You can add more than one project subrecord to any object, but in practice, I think that will be extremely rare. Once you've added a project subrecord and exited edit mode, you can view the project details. This view is the same as what you've seen on the project itself with formatted labels and notices and a view of the raw JSON data. The plugin enhances the archive space public user interface, the PY, as well. It adds the labels and notices images for the linked project just under the record title. Each image is linked to a full label or notice text in the body of the record. The body of the record adds a new subsection, which includes the label and notice details, a link to the project on the local context sub, and any translations of the labels or notices. Labels details also include the name of the community responsible for the label. Because archive space presents data in a hierarchical context, we needed to design a system for inheriting linked project data down that hierarchical tree. To solve that, we came up with some simple rules. Linked project data is inherited down the tree unless an object is itself linked directly to a project. Objects that inherit project data details display those with a link to the object the project data is inherited from. Here's a concrete illustration of what that inheritance display in the PUI looks like. A series has a project linked to it. It has two child files. One file is directly linked to a project different from the series. The file without a directly linked project displays the information inherited from the series with a note and link to the parent series. The file directly linked to a project just displays that directly linked project data. The open to collaborate notice is a special case since it's something that an institution can choose to display independent of a specific project. If you choose to enable this notice, you'll first want to add the notice to your account on the local context hub. Once you do, you can update the configuration and the notice will display on the PUI homepage. The plugin also includes the local context data in the staff and PUI exports. Here are some examples of what that exported data looks like. Staff side PDF exports on the left and a sample EAD export on the right. Note that these both include a link to view the project data on the local context hub, as well as the date that the export was created on. This is useful if you've got an old export and the local context project details may have changed in the meantime. You always have a way to see the current labels and notices for any project. It also indicates to the reader that this is a static snapshot that may have changed. The mappings for the EAD and EAD3 exports is tentative and I'm working with the local context team and others to finalize them. Mark exports are also planned, and I'm working with the local context team and the technical implementation working group to provide a default mapping for that schema as well. 
The plugin is available on GitHub and works with ArchiSpace versions 3.1.1 up to 3.3.1. I plan to continue to provide support for the plugin for future ArchiSpace releases and have begun to think about ways this might be implemented in the core application. Pull requests, future requests, or comments are encouraged since we're hoping that this meets the ArchiSpace community's needs. Finally, thank you for listening. Here's my contact information if anyone would like to get in touch to discuss the integration in more detail or as ideas for enhancements. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the summit. Ditch. Hello, my name is Anne McCartney, and I would like to thank the organizers at the Local Context Summit for the invitation to share this space with you today. Uh, my talk will focus on how we are operationalizing the care principles for responsible biodiversity data sharing and management. I'm an assistant researcher here at the Genomics Institute and the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional and unceded lands that I live, work, and play on today of the Amamutsun tribe. If you have any questions at all following from this talk, I've just dropped my Twitter handle and my email address at the bottom right hand side of the screen. So to kick us off, I'd like to give you some background context for my talk today, which is that we are in our sixth mass extinction and our interconnected web of life is getting all the more smaller and increasingly frayed as a direct consequence of predominantly anthropocentric impacts. So on the left hand side of your screen here, I'm just highlighting the massive amount of biodiversity loss that our planet has experienced since the 1970s and how this is not a regional specific problem, but rather a planetary problem shared by all of humanity. However, not all segments of the human population have contributed to the biodiversity crisis equally. And on the right hand side of the screen, this is a, I'm just highlighting that it has resulted in today's unequal distribution of uh, biodiversity on the Earth's surface. Interestingly, of the remaining biodiversity, 80% overlays the lands of indigenous peoples and local communities who have and continue to act as stewards of these lands since time immemorial. So the biodiversity crisis is not new to Western science and Western science has been pursuing um, policies, research practices and protocols to help conserve, protect and restore biodiversity. And I'm just highlighting a couple of these here. However, Western science is not outside of the socio-political realities and inequities that stem from that. And I've just included some of those um, inequalities and how they manifest in Western scientific biodiversity conservation practices here in Gray. Um, these inequity, inequities came to the fore on an international platform through, um, and it was understood that we needed to put in place biodiversity, biodiversity conservation policies. One of the policies here that was developed and codified in 20, 2002 was the Convention on Biological Diversity, which has three main pillars, including con conservation of biological diversity, its sustainable use, and ensuring that all benefits that accrue from the access and utilization of these, this biodiversity is fairly and equitably shared. In order to put some more guardrails around pillar three here, in 2010, the Nagoya Protocol entered into force, codifying a bilateral mechanism for ensuring a benefit sharing um, was fair and equitable between parties. Um, whilst the, in the policy arena, things were, were shifting and changing in regards to biodiversity conservation, so too was Western academia. And so with huge technological advancements, the value of biodiversity shifted away from physical access, getting access and utilizing the physical biodiversity resources toward accessing and using the genetic sequencing information that had been extracted from these resources. And so you had this transformational shift in value of uh, within the Western academic community away from physical resources 
to the digital resources. And this community really is motivated by wanting to create an actionable corpus of genomics knowledge, sequencing knowledge about all of the species on Earth in hope that researchers can access and use this corpus of knowledge to better conserve, protect and restore biodiversity. So I'm just highlighting on this slide that since the codification of the Nagoya Protocol, which just um, concerns the fair and equitable use of the physical specimen, um, there's actually been a boom in the generation of genomic sequencing data within the public data archives. And that's shown on the left-hand side of your screen. However, on the right-hand side of your screen, I break that down a little bit further and show showcase that although there has been this boom in data archives, 52% of the sequencing information that is housed within these archives has been submitted by just four countries. Um, and this again just shows that there's an, an inequitable ability to contribute sequences um, and also to benefit from these sequences in these archives. And in acknowledgement of that unfairness and inequity, there was another shift in the policy, biodiversity conservation policy arena just last year, where we adopted the global biodiversity framework, which expanded the Convention of Biological Diversity to, for the first time, include fair and equitable share benefit sharing for digital sequence information and a multilateral framework for how this would happen was adopted during um, this conference of parties specifically. As part of the discussion on what was adopted by the global biodiversity framework, um, in order for this multilateral system for benefit sharing to actually work, it was acknowledged that as a uh, an appropriate system for data governance was needed. And it was specifically called for the implementation of both the FAIR and the CARE principles of data governance. And this is important because this is the first time in a biodiversity conservation policy arena on the international scale that called uh, and acknowledged and recognized in print these principles for indigenous data governance. And so the biodiversity community as a community whose the creation of digital sequence information is its bread and butter, we had to really take seriously about how to operationalize both the FAIR and the CARE principles within our projects um, as we moved forward. And so first we really needed to understand what does a typical biodiversity genomics data project look like? And so we mapped a typical data life cycle. And then we thought about how did they broadly, how did the fair and prayer care principles actually map to each of these steps across the data life cycle? And then how do we more granularly um, implement and uh, implement these principles. Um, and so we thought using the five A's of appropriate action here uh, would be a good step in how to think through operationalizing the care principles when constructing a partnership with Indigenous peoples and local communities. And these five A's stand for acknowledgement, authority, access, authorship, and attribution. Not only did we want to ensure the five A's were um, maintained across the data life cycle, but we also had to ensure that they remain, were maintained across the actors that were participating across the data life cycle. And, and these actors include repo data repositories, institutions, funding bodies, public, uh, publishers, etc. And one of the ways we thought about um, implementing and thinking through how to implement the five A's of appropriate action and fundamentally implementing and operationalizing the care principles was through the local uh, partnership with the local context hub and the implementation of the labels and notices. And I won't go into depth on what the labels and notices are, as I'm sure you've heard a lot about that in this summit already, but rather I'll give you, um, I'll highlight how we have implemented them in the biodiversity genomic space through this case study of the European Reference Genome Atlas. So the European Reference Genome Atlas has a mission to sequence all eukaryotic life across Europe. And to do this, it aims to build a decentralized infrastructure that can support 
the production of a reference genome or a book of life for each species that exists in Europe. But not only that, it's it, with its decentralized nature, it hopes to ensure that the infrastructure is inclusive so that all re researchers across any country can participate in the project. But not only that, um, it can it also aims to encourage the participation and inclusion of citizen scientists and indigenous peoples and local communities. To pilot um, this infrastructure, we um, tested it across 98 species uh, that span 15 phyla across the phylogenetics tree of life. And I th show that on the left-hand side of the screen. And these samples were provided by researchers positioned in 33 con European countries. So I'm just highlighting the different steps of the infrastructure that we created. And I'll just talk you through how um, we ensured the operationalization of the fair and care principles throughout the genomics infrastructure. And so a key part of this was actually building awareness of the of what the care principles are and what the traditional knowledge and biocultural enables are from the outset of the, the infrastructure. And so each, um, if you just look at step two here, which is it just gives a description of the pre-sampling procedures that are required for each researcher that is participating in this project to, um, to do before they would collect samples for the project. And here there's documentation that um, guides researchers to if they are partnering with an indigenous peoples or local communities to register with the local context hub and um, immediately apply either a traditional knowledge or biocultural notice. This notice can then in step three be positioned in the ERGA metadata manifest, which has been intentionally created to include a unique field for the um, the inclusion of a notice into that metadata through the permanent unique identifier issued by the local context hub. All of these, all of this metadata is then automatically update, uploaded into our metadata brokering service that validates that all of the metadata is complete and it is following our requirements our minimal ERGA requirements. Not only this, but our metadata brokering service has an API that integrates with the local context hub, and it allows for that notice that was disclosed by the researcher during step three to be up, potentially updated to a label if, if that is appropriate, if an Indigenous community uh, indigenous or local community has updated the notice to the label. So from there, the samples that have been collected and the metadata, depending on what's appropriate and for that specific species, enters into the public archive through bio, the Biosamples repository or would be stored within a managed access internal data, ERGA data repository. It would then be... Um, follow uh, forward into high molecular DNA uh, extra DNA extraction for and then sequencing and the assembly of the reference genome at the end. Um, and then ideally, um, we would then what happens at this point um, is is that the genome the genome assembly and the digital sequence and raw digital sequence information either enters into the public archive in our case being the European nucleotide archive or to the uh, a managed uh, internal data repository that we have for the project and the, in doing this we can link, the genetics, the genomics data information with the sample information. And so the metadata, the, the sample information's metadata is linked to the genomics data's data metadata. And so this is a way that 
the label or notice that has been associated with the sample can subsequently be transferred through and recognized um, alongside the genomics sequencing information that is produced at the back end. And so this is, we've demonstrated that this is possible to do in a scalable and streamlined manner in the European context. But there are other projects across the globe that are also instituting the labels, uh, the labels and notices system, including genomics Aotearoa, which is aims to sequence all of Aotearoa's biodiversity. And they have a data repository that is also implementing the labels and uh, the labels and notices in uh, consistent with both the FAIR and the CARE principles. And we're hoping that by using these sandboxes that we'll end up, um, that we'll create a discussion and an awareness of the labels and uh, the notices amongst the biodiversity research community. And we've already started discussions with the Vertebrate Genomes Project, the, uh, the Earth Biogenome Project in Canada. And we hope that over time that we can scale this to be a recognized standard of practice for all researchers in the field of biodiversity genomics. And one way to think about doing this is through making this a minimum requirement for uh, being recognized as a reference genome for the Earth Biogenome Project, whose mission it is to sequence all of Earth's eukaryotic biodiversity. But we also want to think through how can we work with public data repositories to create interoperable, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable um, standards of practice for the upload of genomic sequencing information and also create space for ensuring that we have appropriate metadata requirements that align with the care principles. So to do this, one key way will be ensuring we are creating space for the labels and the notices within these public data repositories. With that, I would like to thank all of the collaborators that have worked so hard on implementing the labels and notices in the biodiversity genomic space. And again, as I said at the start of my talk, if you have any questions or feedback for me, please reach out to me through Twitter or on my email. And again, thank you for the, to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today.